A chance to sit atop the AFC South goes away, as does the winning streak. Welcome into the channel. I'm Cody Stutes. Let's talk some Texans. The Jaguars too much for the Texans. 24-21, the final score. Obviously, it was almost 24-24. The kicker comes up just a tiny bit short there late, but it never should have been in that position for this Texans team. Let's dive into some of the big takeaways from this game. Let's start on the offensive side of the football for this Texans team, and it was just not good overall on offense. I understand that C.J. Stroud added to his impressiveness as a rookie quarterback with some of the play extension, obviously with the amount of yards that he had, the big plays that he did make for this team, the couple of touchdowns, the rushing touchdown as well. Stroud had a pretty nice day, but he had to make a lot of that happen for this team. And I don't believe that this team operates well with that being the primary way to make plays. We saw it today. It's far too inconsistent to rely on C.J. Stroud running around and trying to create. It takes a lot of juice out of Stroud. It takes a lot of juice out of the offensive linemen. It takes a lot of juice out of the wide receivers too. This is not a game football that's built for guys to run around for 30, 40 seconds. This is built for a play to take 10, 12, 18 seconds, and then you take 30, 40 seconds to reset, and then you run the next play. That's not how the game is built, and you can see it there late, some of the hands on the hips, breathing hard late in the game from the wide receivers. In structure is how this team operates best with that improvisation of C.J. Stroud mixed in. We saw some of the limitations of the improvisation being the primary way to move the ball. I don't want to fault C.J. Stroud or really anybody on the offense because that's what it felt like they had to do to move the football. So by virtue of that, the offense just has to be a lot better. You have to call better plays. You have to trust your team more. You have to operate better within structure. You have to run the ball more, okay? Just six carries for Devin Singletary who was coming off back-to-back 100-yard games. That's a little curious. Uh, you worked in Damian Pierce a little bit. Ultimately, the running backs average less than three yards a carry on just a handful of opportunities over the course of this game. The game was never out of reach where you felt like you couldn't run the football. So some of the success we saw on the ground, and I get that's a Jaguars team that's played a little bit better on defense in recent weeks and has had some success against the rushing attack, but you need to be able to still run the football, keep you on schedule, run some of those plays within structure on offense. It just wasn't good enough in structure. So CJ Stroud had to improvise and it didn't always work out. Credit to him and credit the offense for making something happen on a lot of those plays, but sometimes it just, there wasn't anything there. You just didn't have room. CJ couldn't make a decision or maybe he should have run the ball when instead he threw the ball, or maybe he should have thrown the ball when maybe he should have started to run the ball. There's too much of that. It's better to have that added in as a bonus within structure of the offense. Part of the reason this team couldn't operate in structure is they couldn't block anybody. My goodness, what happened to this offensive line? I get that Titus Howard went down with the injury and you put Juice Scruggs in there, but Scruggs played pretty decent filling in for Howard, and Howard was getting worked early on in this game. There was a play where Laramie Tunsil and Devin Singletary blocked the same guy, and then the free rusher just had a free shot there at C.J. Stroud. Stroud got sacked a handful of times. They got seven quarterback hits on him. That was an unacceptable pressure performance by the offensive line. They allowed far too much pressure, which led to C.J. Stroud, and that pressure coming early led to C.J. Stroud trying to improvise and maybe not trusting that offensive line as much as he could have, but I understand it. When you start to feel some heat and you start to feel some pressure early on in the game, I understand why you wouldn't trust that offensive line, why you wouldn't step up into the pocket and you try to run around and make something happen. They did not do a good enough job protecting C.J. Stroud and allowing this offense to operate the way that it needs to operate. That was a lot of four-man rushes that got home, too. Like It felt like the pressure was coming from a four-man, three-man rush, and the Jaguars were content to put seven or eight guys back there to muddy things up. Stroud talked about it after the game. They were rushing a lot less guys than they expected. This is one of the most blitz-heavy teams in the NFL. Okay, top 10 in most of the blitz and pressure stats. And they were sending three, four guys regularly, and they were getting pressure on this Texans offensive line. 
That can't happen. You've spent too much money on this offensive line, and I get you got a bunch of backups in there, but you've got to be able to protect C.J. Stroud, let him operate within the offense, and let him operate within structure and have some success with this Texans team. The blocking up front from the offensive linemen, the fullback helping out, the tight ends helping out, it wasn't good enough. It wasn't good enough. Even when they had extra blockers in there, it felt like four or five guys were getting home on a pretty regular basis and forcing Stroud out of the pocket, forcing him into that improvisation. Not good enough. They've got to protect, and they've got to block much better up front. That was something that really stuck out to me. Speaking of pressure, where was the Texans' defensive line? There was almost no pressure on Trevor Lawrence in this game. In fact, I'm being generous. There was no pressure on Trevor Lawrence in this game. Very rarely was Lawrence in any sort of danger of getting sacked. They got two quarterback hits on him all day, and he could use his legs to extend the play enough to make a play and to make a pass there from the pocket or from the rollout. Heck, there was one play where he dropped back like 12 yards and still made a play throwing the ball. No pressure, and that's on Will Anderson, Sheldon Rankins, Malik Collins, Jonathan Grenard, uh, Kurt Heinisch, uh, Khalil Davis, Jerry Hughes, Kerry Hyder. They've got to be able to get home. This defense works when you can have a four-man pass rush. They were not able to get home on the four-man pass rush not even on a regular basis, on any basis. The pass rush was non-existent for most of this game, which leads to some blitzing sometimes, which Trevor Lawrence goes and makes some big plays against the blitz from time to time, and he can just make a quick decision. I get that the pass rush sometimes gets neutralized, okay, because Trevor Lawrence makes a quick decision. Well, he's not making a quick decision every single time. Some of those big explosive plays – take time to develop, and pass rush wasn't getting home. Again, this defense has to have a four-man rush, get home on a consistent basis to operate at its peak level. They didn't have that, and so you saw the Jaguars offense really take off today. Trevor Lawrence had a career high for passing yards in the first half. When you have all the time in the world, Calvin Ridley can go out there and make seven moves and get open against the various Texans defenders that get thrown at him. Lawrence had a big day offensively. The Jaguars had a bunch of huge plays. They had multiple plays over 40 yards. They had an over 50-yard play through the air. One of them was just a super well-timed screen as well. So I know that's not an air yards, 50 yards, but it still counts as a passing play. Part of that is the pass rush not getting home, making everything else easy for the rest of this defense. That one was tough. Finally, we talk about the kicker a little bit here in this. The kicker, he misses the field goal. He misses the long, long field goal there at the end. Truthfully, he never should have been in the position for the long field goal. If they got him a handful more yards, we watch overtime on Sunday. The, the, the offense wasn't good enough there. He has to make that field goal earlier in the game, though. He's now missed field goals in back-to-back games. I understand he hit the game winner a few weeks ago. Okay, what's what have you done for me lately in the kicking industry? Okay, and he hasn't made enough field goals. He squeaked through an extra point, so you're a little nervous about that aspect of his game as well. So kicking situation is rough. The Texans are an offense. That's going to stall out sometimes. They've got to be able to put three points on the board, and I would wonder greatly about kicker tryouts and maybe even a change at kicker. Kaimi Fairbairn can't come back just yet uh, from the injured reserve, and I don't know that he is ready to come back. So Matt Amendola, uh, rough day for him, tough day for him. The Texans may not have Matt Amendola as the kicker when they host the Broncos next week. I said final thing. That's my final big observation. I do want to say one thing about the officiating. I believe the officiating was terrible in this game, but I don't think it was terribly one-sided. Yes, I understand a lot of calls went against the Texans. There was the absolute bull crap call against Steven Nelson. I didn't like the pass interference against Tavier Thomas in the end zone. I tend to agree a little bit with the play earlier in that drive. And then the motion... Uh, the illegal shift, illegal motion, whatever it's called on Tank Dell that wiped away the 50-yarder. That one 
is tough in the moment. I could see why the official made that call. Obviously, as we watch it back 10 times, we see that Tank Dell was headed sideways. He wasn't headed forward. I don't believe that should have been called or allowed to stay. That wasn't a good one. And then the review. Look, I can see the still images after the game. The officials don't see that. The officials don't see the still images after the game. The officials don't see the still images during the game. And in the review, they watch video copy. And on the video copy, it's too hard to say if that was a catch or not a catch. Here's what I would say. One official said catch. One official said no catch. Initially, the official behind the play, he said catch. The official uh, in front of the play, or in front of Dell, he said no catch. They conversed. They, they said no catch. It felt to me like watching that, watching the review process, Whatever the call was, was going to stand. I do believe Tank Dell got both feet down. But the grainy TV version where you couldn't get a clear without a shadow of a doubt shot, they got to call that an incomplete. I don't love that. I don't love that that went against the Texans. Obviously, that one stunk. But I didn't feel like the officials went out of their way to absolutely screw the Texans. Uh, the Texans got an interception and ultimately scored on the ensuing drive because the officials absolutely missed a horrific uh, tackling of a wide receiver by Jalen Petrie. Uh, or later on in the game, the Texans had a really bad hold uh, that the officials called a defensive hold instead. So, again, it was a overall poorly officiated game. I don't believe that the officials – totally and wholly decided this one by any way, stretch, or form. And as you're talking to Henry Toa, Toa after the game, like I talked to him, he said, look, if you don't agree with the flag, you can go out there and you're still going to go make another play. Uh, the officials aren't the reason the Texans had, I think, four plays of over 40 yards allowed in this game. The officials aren't the reason Trevor Lawrence had a career high for passing yards in the first half, and the officials didn't miss two field goals, and the officials didn't make the Texans operate out of structure in their offense over the course of the whole day. Won a good officiated game, but I'm not going to sit here and cry about the Zebras costing the Texans the game. Yes, it would have been nice to have a perfectly officiated game, but the Texans benefited from some of the poor calls in this game as well. It stinks. It definitely puts a damper on the chances to win the AFC South. The Jaguars now have a two-game lead on you. They likely will win the tiebreaker, okay, should you get record even with them because it's going to be about division wins. It's going to be about, after that, AFC wins. They're going to win the tiebreaker even if you get some help in getting them caught up, getting the Texans caught up in the record column. So that one's tough. So now you got to think about the wild card. All right, the Cleveland Browns, you have a chance to own the tiebreaker with them when you play Cleveland later this year. You've got the Cincinnati Bengals in the playoff hunt, kind of on the outskirts of the playoff hunt. But you got a, you got the tiebreaker over them. You've got the tiebreaker over the Pittsburgh Steelers. I believe right now you have the tiebreaker over the Buffalo Bills. And then you've got to think about the Indianapolis Colts. Obviously, it'll be incredibly necessary from a playoff standpoint to beat the Colts in the final week of the season to cement yourself in that wild card spot as well. Those scenarios will get more complicated. Oh, the Denver Broncos next week. You can you need to beat them and have the tiebreaker over them. They're hanging around the AFC playoff picture. Those scenarios will start to play out over the coming weeks, but it is a kick in the pants here on this one because a victory over the Jaguars would have had the Texans as the top team in the AFC South and set to host a playoff game and control of their own destiny when it came to the playoffs. Now they still control their own destiny because they win enough, but they don't control their own destiny when it comes to a division championship. And for the time being, the Jaguars as the top team in the AFC, nobody believes that, but they were better than the Texans on Sunday. Appreciate you watching the video. Please get in the comment section, like thumbs up, and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. I greatly appreciate the support here. Over 4,000 subscribers. Thank you, everybody, for subscribing and watching as much as you do. I really enjoy talking Texans here on YouTube, but I can't wait till we talk Texans again soon.